Hello, so this is the first of two parts on series in AP Calculus DC. This unit is absolutely gigantic, and there's no way I would be able to fit it all in a video of a reasonable length. As you can see, there are already a lot of topics that we're talking about in this video alone. Let's quickly talk about what a series is. Sorry, I'm not the wrong way. So a series is basically when we're trying to add stuff up, and we're using the Greek letter sigma here to show that. You can add a finite series with a specific number of terms, or you can add an infinite series, which, as the name suggests, has an infinite number of terms. It's obvious that adding finite series will give you a finite answer, but what's less obvious is that sometimes an infinite series can sometimes give you a finite answer too. In AB Calculus, they will give you an infinite series, and you will be asked whether it converges, which means it does give you a finite answer, or if it diverges, which means it does not give you a finite, finite answer. <laughs> to figure out whether a series converges or diverges, you will need to use one of many tests, such as the nth term test or the direct comparison test. So I'm going to walk you through all the tests that you're going to need to be familiar with. You may already be familiar with the geometric series from, uh, from geometry class, but if you look at the terms of this series in order, you notice a pattern. The next term comes from multiplying the previous term by a constant. The way to express this in sigma notation is here, where a is a constant, not necessarily the first term, and r is the common ratio. If we took the series here and kept going on forever and ever and ever, multiplying by one half each time and kept adding it up, as we have it represented by this sigma, would we get a finite answer? Well, it's pretty easy to figure that out. If the absolute value of your common ratio r is less than 1, then your series will converge. If the ratio is greater than or equal to 1, then you will diverge. In our case, since our common ratio is 1 half, which is less than 1, the series will converge to a finite number. What number will it converge to? Well, there's a formula for that, as shown here. In this formula, a1 is the first term. a1 is not the same as a. Sometimes it is, but it's not always. And then r is the common ratio. In our case, the first term is 2. Common ratio is 1 half. Remember, that's what we're multiplying by each time. So the sum is 4. If we were to add this series forever and ever and ever, we would get closer and closer to 4. Obviously, the formula only works if the absolute value of r is less than 1. You can recognize if a series is geometric if the sigma notation is a constant times um, the common ratio to the power involving n. On the AP test, where you will likely be asked to explain your answer, just write this stuff here. For all the other tests that we're going to talk about, I'll also display the words that you should know that you should write when you're explaining the answer for that series. The next, the next type of series that you should know is the telescoping series. This series always converges. You can recognize the telescoping series as being a fraction minus another fraction. If we were to list out the first few terms of the series, you'll notice a pattern. Things begin to cancel. It may not always be as obvious as this is, but if it is a telescoping series, you will get all this cancellation. The best way to figure out what a telescoping series converges to is to write out all the terms like we've done here, then cancel everything out. For all the stuff that remains, take the limit as n approaches infinity. That is your answer. A quick note with these telescoping series, sometimes you might see them written like this. This is actually the same series we saw before, just in a different form. In this case, you will have to use partial fraction, partial fraction decomposition to split them up into a fraction minus a fraction, or you might have to use another one of the tests that we will talk about. The next test is the easiest and most awesome series ever. This is the harmonic series. The harmonic series is a constant over n. If you have an infinite series that is a constant over n, you immediately know that it diverges. End of story. That's it. Harmonic series will diverge. So for the next few tests, these aren't as easily recognizable as the first few, but they're still very, very useful. The nth term test is used when you can easily take the limit of your series. It can tell you if your series diverges. All you have to do is to take the limit of the stuff in the series as n approaches infinity. If your answer is anything other than 0 or does not exist, so if it's 1, 7, 
plus or minus infinity, 96, whatever your series is going to diverge. If your limit is equal to 1 or does not exist, then your answer is no conclusion. The nth term test does not tell you if the series converges. Even if the limit is 0 or does not exist, the series could still diverge. Either you know for sure it diverges or you have no clue. Next up, we've got p series. These are a series with a constant over n to a power p. If p is greater than 1, then the series converges. If p is less than 1, then the series diverges. What do you think happens if p is equal to 1? That's right. If p is equal to 1, then we have the harmonic series, which means it's going to diverge. Okay? So basically, if p is greater than 1, the series converges. If p is less than or equal to 1, the series diverges. Next is the integral test. Yep, we still have calculus in series. We use this if the stuff in the series can easily be integrated. The function also needs to meet some conditions. It has to always be positive, continuous, and decreasing for all n greater than or equal to 1. So if we take the series and make the stuff inside of it a function, we see that it is indeed positive, continuous, and decreasing, since the denominator can never be 0 or negative, and the power on top is less than the power on the bottom. If all these conditions were not met, you could not use the integral test, and you would have to use some other test instead. So what does this test actually say? Well, if the conditions are met, it tells us that if we integrate the stuff in the series from 1 to infinity, that will tell us if the series converges or diverges. If the integral converges, so does the series. If the integral diverges, the series does too. However, note that if the integral converges to a number, that does not mean that the series converges to the same number. The integral test does not tell us what the series will converge to. So, for example, if the integral came out to be pi over 3, then the series does not necessarily converge to pi over 3. It just converges to something. Now, let's look at the direct comparison test. First, let me give you the definition. If we have two series, A and B, where the A series is always smaller than the B series, we can make two conclusions. If B converges, then A converges as well. If A diverges, then B diverges as well. I think the best way to explain this is with these graphs. We have the value of the sum on the y-axis and the terms that we're adding, the number of terms that we're adding, rather, on the x-axis. Since A is smaller, it's always going to be under B. So if we know that the series on top here converges, then clearly the series on the bottom must converge too, since it's smaller than the one on the top. And on the other hand, say the series look like this one on the right, if we know that the series on the bottom diverges, then we can also say that the series on the top diverges too, because it's always going to be bigger than the one on the bottom. So what can we do with this information? Say we have this series. It looks very similar to this, doesn't it? And by the p-series test, we know that this 1 over n to the fourth series, this converges. So if we can somehow prove that our series is always smaller than the 1 over n to the fourth series, then we know it will also converge by the direct comparison test. If that logic was a little bit confusing, go back and forth between this slide and the graphs. So basically what we're trying to say is we're trying to prove that 1 over n to the 4th plus 1 is always less than 1 over n to the 4th to be able to use the direct comparison test. So if we try to figure this out, we'll cross multiply. n to the 4th is less than n to the 4th plus 1. Subtract n to the 4th from both sides. 0 is less than 1. So we got a true statement, right? Which is, all, this is always true. So we proved that our series is always smaller than 1 over n to the 4th. So it's going to converge by the direct comparison test. Going back to the graph, 1 over n to the 4th is the black one, and 1 over n to the 4th plus 1 is the pink one. Our series, which is a, to n, a sub n, is always smaller than the one that converges, b sub n, so our a sub n always converges as well. As you can tell, it's, it's really handy to memorize whether some common series converge or diverge to be able to effectively use the direct comparison test. Sometimes, the direct comparison test doesn't work. Well, don't worry then. The limit comparison test is here to save the day. This test is really similar to, to what we were doing before in that we're comparing a series that you don't know to a series that you do know about. You can use the limit comparison test when both the series have positive terms. 
take this series for example. If you tried the direct comparison test and compared it to this, it wouldn't work. Go on. Pause this video and try it for yourself. Use the direct comparison test and see why it doesn't work. So anyways, for the limit comparison test, what we do is we take the limit as n approaches infinity of the unknown series over the known one. This is the unknown series, this is the known one. So we take 1 over 2 to the n minus 1 over 1 over 2 to the n. If the answer is a positive finite number, so basically not negative, not 0, and not positive or negative infinity, then the original series is the same as the series we're comparing it to. So if the series that we're comparing it to converges, so does the unknown series. And the same would be true if the series diverged. Are you keeping up? I hope so, because we have three more tests to go. Next up is the alternating series test. An easy way to tell if an a series is alternating is if it has this negative 1 to the n or negative 1 to the n plus 1 or something like that. It's alternating because the terms switch from positive to negative over and over again because of this negative 1. Something really, really important. Sometimes instead of negative 1, you might see a cosine of pi n. This is the same as negative 1 to the n because if you plug in increasing values of n, you'll notice that the cosine graph or this cosine function goes back and forth between negative 1 and 1 just like this guy here does. So it's basically the same thing, still alternating. So the alternating series test that if the alternating series test says that if three conditions are met, then the series will converge. So for this for this test, just ignore the negative one part, only focus on the rest of the series. For the rest of the series, all the terms have to be positive, all the terms have to be getting smaller, so the series is decreasing, and the limit as n approaches as n approaches infinity has to be equal to zero. So it fails the nth term test. The nice thing about this is, is if you realize that the limit is not equal to zero, then you can tell the series diverges by the nth term test. If these three conditions are met, then the series will converge. Another thing you might need to be familiar with when dealing with uh, these, these alternating series is the difference between absolute and conditional convergence. So if you concluded that the series converges by the alternating series test, to determine whether it converges absolutely or conditionally, just look at the series without the negative one part. So notice here we're looking at this series, here we're just looking at the main part of the series without the negative one to the n. So if the series on its own converges, then we have absolute convergence. If it diverges without the negative one, then it's conditional convergence. The reason, with the, the reason for that is that the fact that whether the series converges or not is conditional on whether the negative one is there in this bottom case. Okay, we're on the home stretch. Don't give up now. This is the ratio test. This test is really handy when we're dealing with exponential functions with n in the power or we're dealing with factorials. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the limit as n approaches infinity of the n plus 1th term divided by the nth term. So if this is our series, it would look something like this. n plus 1 over 2 to the n plus 1 divided by the nth term, which is n factorial over 2 to the n, like that. So if this limit is less than 1, then the series converges. If this limit is greater than 1, or is plus or minus infinity, then the series is divergent. If the limit is equal to 1, then there's no conclusion and we have to use a different test. Okay, finally, we have the root test. This test is good for nth powers. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the limit of the absolute value of the nth root as n approaches infinity. If the limit is less than 1, so if this is less than 1, then we have the series converges. If the series is more than 1, or infinity, then the series diverges. If it is equal to 1, then there is no conclusion, and we have to use a different test. Okay, so I think we need a minute to recap after all of that. We just went through 11 different tests to determine if an infinite series converges or diverges. Geometric and telescoping series will tell you exactly what a series converges to, but other tests will only tell you whether it converges or diverges. 
you may need to watch the video one more time to really understand everything. I know I'm going really fast. I would recommend that. And then afterwards, the best way to get better at solving series is to just do a bunch of them. To help you with that, you can use my problem solving video for this unit, which has a bunch of series that you might want to try solving for practice. I've also attached a document in the description that I made when I was taking BC to help me keep track of all the series. I found it extremely helpful and I hope you will too. In part two of this unit, we won't learn any more tests, but rather we'll go deeper into series, calculate error, and basically do more stuff with the tests we've already learned. I hope you found this video helpful and I will see you next time. Goodbye.